This episode of The Briar Patch is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 180,000 titles for smartphone, tablet, and desktop. To get a free audiobook of your choice and help Trek FM at the same time, visit audibletrial.com slash trekfm. And also by Enterprise in Space, an international program of the nonprofit National Space Society. Find out how you can help science and education and become a virtual crew member aboard the NSS Enterprise Orbiter by visiting enterpriseinspace.org. Want to join the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode? Join the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the Facebook search field. We look forward to seeing you there. This is Robert Picardo, the emergency medical hologram from Star Trek Voyager, and you're listening to Trek FM. This is the 24th century. We've grown out of our infancy. People are no longer obsessed with the accumulation of things. We've eliminated hunger, want. Material needs no longer exist. The acquisition of wealth is no longer the driving force in our lives. Enjoy. Welcome to the Briar Patch. I'm Patrick Devlin, joined today by our co-host, Guinevere Liberty Nell. Hello, Guinevere. Hi, Patrick. How are you? Good. Can't wait to get on with this topic. Today in the Briar Patch, we will be discussing something near and dear to us, the Baku planet. More specifically, the forced migration of the Baku by the United Federation of Planets and the Sona. And other instances in Star Trek where the forced relocation of people have been done or debated. So basically, in this, in the movie Star Trek Insurrection, you have a group, the Sona, looking at relocating people from a planet because they live on a planet that keeps them forever young. There are three types of migration. There's forced, reluctant, and voluntary. Forced is what we see in this movie. Reluctant is more of natural disasters causing people to be forced off their land, maybe rising tides, rising rivers, dried up rivers, such like that. And then you have voluntary migration where a person or a group of people will pick up and move because they feel like it. Move to another country, find a new culture, whatever the case may be. So, Guinevere, what are your thoughts on the reasons the Sonar had to force relocate to Baku? I find this a really interesting episode to discuss because although forced migration itself is a you know very important topic, I find it interesting because there are actual reasons why one might think that the Baku should be asked to leave. People, of course, wouldn't want to see them, you know, forced violently off planet, but a lot of people would probably feel that the Baku had been violent in the past to the Sona, and the Sona had reason to be upset, and also the Baku had this immortality, and some might feel that, if possible, that should be shared that others should be able to benefit, including the Sona, but maybe the whole Federation should be able to benefit, if possible, from this medical breakthroughs that could come from uh, from the planet's rings and, and so forth, right? Correct. It's, it's kind of an interesting study in that we don't know in the beginning, but we do find out that the Sona were actually rejected by the Baku. The Baku had, t- had told them to leave because they wanted to use technology, which they were very against, we see to the point that they're not even willing to pick up arms to defend themselves, let alone, you know, fly a starship or use warp engines to to power things. The only thing they really have that makes them special is the rings and the fact that they live on this planet where they can literally live forever, providing they don't get diseases, which we don't see any mention of diseases, and they don't kill one another. Other than that, there's no way for them to die. Even the people who got older got younger, and the children grow to a certain age before they stop getting older and just stay that age for eternity. Right, so what I find so interesting is that they are peaceful, they refuse to fight, and they have this kind of perfect utopian society. As you mentioned, they have perfect health, they don't grow old, they can live forever, and they have learned how to be at peace 
they say several times how they've learned to live in the now and live at peace. So you have this kind of utopia, and they're unwilling to be violent in order to protect it. And so then you have data saying, you know, he was uh, completely only basing his actions on morals. He was stuck in a morals only loop, if you will, or something uh, as an android. And so his morality told him that the Baku should be protected and they were unwilling to use violence and living in this utopia. So this brings some very interesting questions up about what kind of political theory we should use to analyze whether they should be left completely alone, whether data is correct in his moral conclusions. Right. Is it morally wrong to remove a people for the betterment of more people? Exactly. Like Spock's, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one. But when do you get to many and few? Because there's 600 people on the planet. Are they still the few... Be- are, are we going on a percentage? 600 people is a, lot, is a small percentage compared to the galaxy. Or is it once you hit 100 people or 200 people or 300 people that it becomes many and we no longer use that theory? Exactly. This is precisely why it's so interesting because if you use, say, consequentialism to analyze this or a utilitarian approach, you might say... As Spock said, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. So then you could look at the galaxy compared to the planet and do it based on purely numbers. But there are other theories that would say it doesn't matter the numbers. For example, Aristotle speaks about, but I'm not going to get into philosophy purely. That would, Metatrex could analyze it from that point of view. But the idea being that if you have a virtue ethics or if you do it on the basis of not numbers, but what is right or wrong in a kind of a universal sense, then you would have a different different outcome to your analysis. And what I find quite interesting is from a political theory perspective, the most definitive political theory that talks about the protection of a nonviolent people and the importance of using no violence against them and protecting the society is actually a libertarian theory, which one might not expect. And it actually works perfectly, this movie rather works perfectly as a representation of a moral struggle as understood by a libertarian theory called the non-aggression principle. And the non-aggression principle says that You cannot use any violence except the government, for example, cannot use any violence against the people except that which is necessary to prevent violence being done to those people. So I can, as a police officer, uh, as a representative of the state, I can use just enough violence as is necessary to prevent you from using violence against someone else in the society. And that's all. That's the only violence that can be used. And the interesting thing about this is it's a perfect way of of looking at this because you have essentially a small group of people who have been privileged, who have more wealth, more of everything that the people will want in a society. So they're a privileged group. And yet they are protected because they're peaceful And no violence should be used except to prevent violence. And so you can use violence against the Sona to prevent them from invading the Baku, but you can't use violence to take from the Baku, even though they have this incredible wealth and inheritance that no one else has. And that's exactly the kind of thing that happens when you use the non-aggression principle as your principle in a society. If, for example, there's a group of privileged, you know, wealthy people today And they may even have gained that wealth through violence of the past. But the non-aggression principle says you can't use violence to take from them what they have. You have to merely only use violence to prevent them from actually using violence against another today, even though there may have been violence in the past that allowed them to become wealthy. So that's why I find it a really interesting movie, a really interesting story for analyzing the non-aggression principle. What do you think of that? It's an interesting take. I believe it's the right one for this scenario. But from a sociological point of view, you would look at it 
either that way or you could also look at it from a <laughs> a Marxist way, which most people only know his economics, but he really started with sociological principles that he morphed into his his economics where everything should be shared by the state. And if everything is shared, then you don't have a problem because everyone gets a little bit of everything. Everyone's fine. That's really interesting that you would bring up Marxist perspective on this because it occurred to me precisely that Marxists would not use a non-aggression principle and would make an argument as you make that, well, if it's all shared, then everyone is going to be better off. And in because they don't focus on, or one might argue that because they don't focus on using violence against an individual or not in their theory, they have ended up using violence against individuals quite often in order to impose the outcome that they want or to impose the method methodology that they want, which would be setting up the socialist state, using planning if necessary to get this equality. And you have actually a famous forced migration that occurred under a Marxist regime, actually, as it was coming to power, which is Mao's uh, Great March. And he brought his followers on a journey that led to, I think, only one third of them reached the end of the journey. They marched in, in such terrible conditions and marched to death. And, you know, and there are many, many examples of Marxism where they have allowed themselves to use these terrible methods along the way because what was important to them is achieving this outcome that they wanted. Whereas the libertarian argument is that an outcome is great, you know, if you if you get it in the end, but the important thing is to set things up in such a way that you do no harm to the individual and you allow the individual to have freedom and then a good outcome can come of that society when you allow people to interact voluntarily. Right, and and that makes sense to me. I just want to make one clarification because there is a difference between Marxism and communism. We've never really seen a true Marxist society because in a true Marxist society, the, the state dissolves. But that it, is it an outcome that they are expecting to happen, but they were setting up the societies precisely along Marxist terms as they understood them, and unfortunately, the outcome that they expected, which is that the state could dissolve away, they never got to that place. And I've written a lot about this, and I can argue all day about it, so it might take us a little off topic if we get into too many more details on that. No, I, I agree. I just, I just want to make that clarification, because people will definitely be yelling you're talking about communism and marxism and th my only point is that marxists or communists really both so it really doesn't matter which one i just don't really like communists but marxists would would believe that you take it away from them and you share it when libertarians would not and capitalists would find a way to make you pay for it but <laughs> th i mean they would sell it so th there's a whole lot of things here at play and you you end up in the movie, you see a couple different factors for this. One factor is the perceived notion that the Federation is weak and that this might save them. You see that the Baku are going to die if they stay on the planet. They can't just go move there and live there. If they do, they won't regenerate fast enough to save at least the majority of them. You, did you mean the Sona or the Baku? Even though at the end of the movie, they do come back. I, I'm sorry, the, the Sona would come back Right. The Sona couldn't just simply move there. They have to take the technology and do it another way. Otherwise, a lot of the Sona wouldn't right. survive. Right. They have to speed That's up the process. Saying, right? If they just moved back to the planet, some would live, but the majority would die. So they needed a way of compacting the abilities of the rings, which is really what the injector is for. It's so they can disperse it. You know, That's how they're selling it to the Federation. But they need it for themselves. It's, it's, if they don't get it that way, it's not going to work and it won't matter. We do see at the end that some do move back, and we really don't get an answer as to whether those particular ones live or die or whatnot, but you would assume their life had to be better to the point where they do die than if they had just stayed on a spaceship somewhere, you know, with their DNA basically degrading as it was. One of the interesting things that this raises is that uh, because the Baku essentially and the Sona were essentially the same society, and so the Baku remaining, as that we call Baku, perpetrated violence against the Sona and kicked them off the planet. So you have a very strong case that the Sona deserve what they're asking for or deserve 
not only to return, for example, to the planet, which, it, as you say, wouldn't be enough to uh, allow them to survive. So there's a very good case for a sort of positive rights for these people, positive rights for the Sona, for example, some compensation. They're entitled to something, one might argue. Correct. You would assume that being kicked off would entitle you to something since you had lived there for however many years before you left because they were there the Baku were there 300 years but we don't know exactly how much earlier the Sona were thrown off the planet and we know they were exiled but I don't remember maybe I'm wrong were they exiled from the society or from the planet itself I believe that they wanted technology to be part of their society and the Baku were the portion of those people of the total planet who didn't want technology to remain part of, you know, a day-to-day part of their society. And they essentially had a little civil war about it. And the Baku are the ones who won. And they asked the Sona to leave. They kicked them off the planet at that, you know, as part of that, the resolution of that civil war, they exiled them. Okay. Cause, cause there is a difference between being kicked off a planet or being told you can't live here, go live somewhere else on the planet, and them deciding to leave instead, in my opinion. That would change how I viewed this scenario as well. I think this is a detail that doesn't necessarily inform our analysis of it, but it is, I suppose, interesting whether they... Perhaps in that case, the Sona don't aren't as deserving. But I think we can take kind of as given that the Sona are fairly deserving, if anyone is. And that raises also the question, is there a broader society, is there any society that is deserving enough that you should drop the non-aggression principle and say instead that they deserve a portion of this? There's a positive positive rights to something that these individuals have, the Sona or whoever. And if you are willing to drop the non-aggression principle then and say they're, they are deserving, what does that do? And why is it that data would, with only morality in mind, side with the Baku in that case? Well, I mean, that's an easy one to answer. He sides with the Baku because he has the Federation's version of ethics. He's programmed to believe the Federation's version, and their number one principle is the prime directive which would just say you don't get involved and you leave the people where they are. Okay, so how does the prime directive compare with the non-aggression principle in this case? Is it because the Federation considers itself an outsider and so the prime directive says do not interfere in this society? Or can we say in a sense that any sort of government affecting any group would be essentially like the Federation in dealing with that group so any kind of intervention by government other than to protect people against violence, if that, non-aggression principle and the prime directive agree that any type of intervention above at least a minimum of life-saving enforcement against violence should be avoided. No, I, I think it does agree with the non-aggression in this particular scenario because at first we're talking about a, a pre warp society. We find out it's not true. They're not pre warp They just decide to get rid of it. And that's really what the Prime Directive is set up for, to not speed up the process of a society. It's not only that. It's also to allow the society to develop naturally and... For sure, a pre-warp society you want to leave alone because you would have greater impact on them culturally if you came in as the Federation with this advanced technology and intervened into them and, and told them about alien life and so forth. But even if they're not pre-warp, you're still supposed to leave them alone to develop on their own and not interfere, essentially. The same way that for example, we might say we should not interfere overseas in other countries for a variety of reasons, including much like the Prime Directive, we might affect them badly or so on. But in any case, if they're a very old fashioned, our version of pre warp, kind of a tribal society, something that retains its culture from hundreds or thousands of years ago, it might be worse for us to interfere with that kind of society 
But still, we might still say we should not interfere. We should not go overseas and intervene with our military in any other country. Yes, but the prime directive isn't only a military action. True. They don't want any connection to these societies. That's like saying, pick a country, and there's an area with a a very primitive tribe living there. It doesn't matter where you go in the world. There's just a primitive tribe. They have almost no contact to the outside world, or they have none. To not go in and study that culture, or not going to study that part of the landscape, the forest, the desert, wherever they may be, not get geological studies, all for the sake of not forcing these people to see you and move towards you and let them evolve or, uh, not the best of words, but I, I, you get my sure. point. Um, I th- More naturally, I don't think that's necessarily a good thing. I don't, I don't necessarily believe that the Prime Directive works as intended in some of these scenarios simply because they're just limiting it to pre-warp. Once they find out that the Baku had warp, they no longer violated the Prime Directive, so it didn't matter. The Prime Directive no longer played a role in this story because they established that they had warp, so it was well, fine. Well, I'm going to disagree slightly. I think that the Prime Directive is a little more complex. It has sort of a level of degrees. So the most extreme is when it's a pre-warp civilization, similarly to the way that we might say if there was a tribal society very primitive on Earth, we wouldn't want to interfere too much with them, and maybe even having any interaction with them could be seen as interfering. So whether or not you agree with that, that for pre-warp society, they're not supposed to contact them at all, because they may not even know about aliens and so forth. They can study them from behind a force field that hides them. I forget the name for that, but um, they can do that, but that's it. And so they violate the prime directive in the extreme version if they are seen. But there's the other part of the prime directive, which is that you can trade with civilizations that have warp technology, but you shouldn't interfere in them politically. You should not get involved in their politics. So when Patrick Stewart ends up, uh, sorry, uh, when pa- Captain Picard has contact with uh, the Klingons and ends up helping them in choosing their new leader, he starts out by saying, I cannot do this. I cannot interfere in your politics. And it was only because they decided that he was already involved and for whatever reasons why he ended up doing that. And of course, many captains violate the prime directive in various ways, but you're not supposed to interfere in the politics of another society, even if they have warp technology. And this would be interfering in their politics if they were going to make a decision on their own between the Baku and the Sona on how to do this. And the Federation comes in and says, we're going to back this side. We're going to either protect the or help the Sona or protect the Baku. Either way, really, is interference. They're just being involved in the moving of the Sona is interference. I mean, it's a Federation hollow deck that they're going to shuffle these people onto so that they don't, you know, they'll they'll site to site transport them so they don't know that they've left. They'll bring them to another planet, which presumably will look exactly like theirs. And then one day they'll wake up and realize they got old and not know why. Which is horrible, and and that is an interference that, I guess, is why Data sees it as as absolutely morally wrong to do that. But he also seems to go a little bit further, and protection of the Baku at all costs, not only against this Federation action, maybe, but he seems to want to protect them and fight for them, or maybe he's only against what the Federation is doing there, which is definitely wrong to move them without even their knowledge, without any discussion, without any kind of compromise, and so on. I do think that there's a TNG episode, I guess it's Homeward, they use a similar technology of moving the people onto a holodeck and without their knowledge moving them. But I would argue in that case, what they're doing is right. Otherwise, they're saving their lives. It's in their best interest. It's in their own, it's in their own like enlightened self-interest, you might say. If they knew what they wanted, they would have wanted to be moved. That's what an enlightened self-interest means. If they knew what was best for them, they would want to have the Federation move them. Whereas in the case of the Baku, their enlightened self-interest, their collective self-interest, their known both 
the self-interest as they know it and the self-interest as they would know it if they were enlightened might say that they should not be moved. Although one might say their truly enlightened self-interest might include the Sona, at least, you know, these people that they treated badly. So maybe their enlightened self-interest would be some type of compromise, but it certainly wouldn't be what the Federation was trying to do. What do you think about Homeward? I mean, that in that case... It certainly made sense to move them, I think. And the prime directive in that case was wrong, don't you think? It was immoral, I would think. And I think having to violate the prime directive was the only way to be moral in that case, even though they were moving them without their knowledge. And I find it interesting that the prime directive seems to have that it's a clear rule that is supposed to be always followed, but in fact it's violated quite often and in many cases it has to be violated for the moral thing to happen, which makes me think that it's an interesting case of whether rules have to be absolute or whether no rule when it's absolute is actually the way to bring about the most moral society. Maybe you need flexibility, maybe you need judges that have discretionary power in order to produce a good outcome in a society. Yeah, absolutely. I definitely agree with that. There's a lot of debate about that, too, on and off over the over the decades. There's a very interesting paper called The Myth of the Rule of Law, and it's a very interesting paper on precisely that, on whether you can have strict rules or whether you need to have some flexibility, some discretionary power in order to have a flexible enough society to have a good outcome. And I think that kind of flexibility, it's the reason why, say, libertarians against Marxists believe in markets. They believe that markets have, an it's one reason, because markets are flexible and they allow evolution and growth, just like we have evolution and growth in culture, which is something that we learn a lot about in Star Trek, that societies evolve both technologically and culturally, and that you need this kind of flexibility. And maybe you need that flexibility in laws as well, even laws like the Prime Directive. If you have that flexibility both in government systems and in the private sector in terms of markets. And this is a question that we'll definitely be discussing more, for example, in our episode on Utopia. And as I was going to say, you have rules, no stealing, right? So that seems pretty clear cut. If I take something from you, I go to prison for a year or go by value or whatever the case may be in that society. That's great. And it's, it's easy to look at, but there should be a way for the judges to decide, well, you know, that guy kind of stole a Rolex watch. He didn't really need that. He should probably get more time than that, that family who stole bread for their children because they're poor. A hard, fast rule that stealing something equals a year in jail would be ridiculous under that scenario. Yeah, it would be a lot like that uh, TNG episode where they almost kill Wesley Crusher for stumbling over, I forget what he stumbled over, but he fell into a garden and they were going to execute him for that. But that's also a question of what punishment fits the crime. But what about just your, you should not have any punishment in some cases, Sometimes stealing is right. That's the kind of flexibility I'm talking about. Like having no, if you violate the prime directive, it's okay because in that case it was actually morally correct to do it. That particular topic is probably better left for an episode all itself. Fair enough. We're kind of veering a little off topic, way too deep into the prime directive at the moment. But I agree that in this episode shows two times that the quote unquote prime directive was broken. First, when the Federation works with the Sona to remove the the Baku, and second, when Captain Picard goes back to fight the Baku to save the Sona. Because even still then, they didn't really know what was going on, and he broke a whole bunch of rules from the Admiral. The Admiral told him to leave, and he told him basically not a chance, and he welcomed the court-martial. He told him, I will have you court martial because if that's what it takes for them to find out back at Starfleet what you're doing here, then I, I gladly welcome it. So, which is an interesting study in protests, which we will probably touch on one of these days. Uh, I don't want to get too deep into it, but most people see a protest, which is what Picard is doing there. And they think, oh, well, this person is doing something bad. They must be a bad person. Not necessarily. And as long as they're willing to take the punishment for whatever they did, whatever the consequences are of their action, 
many people would consider that just in and of itself. Yes, absolutely. Another thing that this movie raises is the question of whether if you benefit from a past wrong, taking us back to the non-aggression principle, if someone inherits from the past, and in this case they didn't inherit from their ancestors, in fact they were the same people who did the wrong, but if you inherit from a past wrong, whether it was your own or someone else's, and so you have the benefits of that, does that change the equation in terms of what should be done, whether there should be, uh, say, a redistribution of that wealth or whether you should have yourself protected from a violence imposed by another, for example. So another episode that explains this or that gets, gets into that topic is called Nothing Human. It's a Voyager episode, and that's the one where Bellana doesn't want to benefit from the medical knowledge that came from a Cardassian scientist torturer who basically tortured the Bajorans and learned from that. And so there was scientific knowledge that came out of that and she refused. And of course, Captain Janeway ended up overriding that preference and uh, imposing it on her. But so this idea of if there's a past wrong, should you benefit from it? And should, you know, should you voluntarily refuse to benefit from it as Balana wanted to do? So the Baku were currently benefiting from something that they did to the Sona in the past, right? They were violent to them in wanting to protect this. And of course, it was a civil war. Maybe you can't blame the Baku entirely, but I get the sense that they were quite violent. So if we take that as given that the Baku were the more violent party among them, and that's why they won, and that's why they ended up, and should they be allowed to benefit from this? Was, in fact, maybe Data wrong to protect them? And even if the Federation was wrong in how they were going about interfering, maybe the right thing should have been to not allow them to keep benefiting from something that they did in the past to the Sona. Well, the only thing I would disagree with is while they do benefit from being on the planet, I don't know if they got that commodity from the Civil War with the Sona in the first place because they had to get to the planet first. They got to the planet, then a war broke out, or then they had their disagreement, and then they sent the Baku on their way. They were benefiting from that before the split in society took place. Is the punishment for the benefit of the commodity, or is there another punishment because of the fight between the two races to begin with, which are really only one race, but... Right. So that's a good point. It's possible that they can't be seen to have benefited more. They've just kept what they had by kicking the the Sona off. I guess if there was a limited amount of it and they were able to hoard it and by kicking off the Sona, they got more of it per person, then, then it would be more directly benefiting. And I don't think that's the case. So in a sense, you're right. They didn't necessarily benefit. They just kept what they already had and they stopped the Sona from having it. Right, which changes the scenario a little bit. I don't know if it changed it enough to change people's opinions on it. Although we see that that Star Trek's interpretation is that it's wrong to remove them. Right. Thinking of that, it's just something that hit me that we keep saying that they're benefiting from the fight itself and from the split. They were there first, so it's it's just a little different. The scenario's twisted a little on, on its head almost. Yeah. Another que- another thing that this raises is about immigration. And you have, I think, libertarians who stick closely to their principles, the non-aggression principle and so forth, believe in an open society with free immigration. And there are, of course, issues that come up and questions about private property of the people who live in the country that someone else wants to immigrate into. Now, most libertarians believe that as long as private property is protected by law, then the immigration is not going to hurt them. Whereas some other people believe that if I allow people to immigrate into this country, I'm hurting the people in this country. And then they want to weigh the rights of the people outside the country and the people in the country. So I think that the question kind of can be looked at in this case, you know, the Sona coming in would probably not hurt the Baku who are already there. 
perhaps. And so you can see that as they should have the right to immigrate into that country. But what if the entire Federation wanted to come in? You know, that you have this question of also of the limited resources in terms of this great abundance that they have. And I I call it abundance because in a sense, it's beyond just uh, the kind of abundance and lack of scarcity that you might get from in a wealthy country, because you actually have no scarcity of time, which is, as we'll discuss in our Utopia episode, something that is almost impossible, maybe impossible to do without this living forever thing that the Baku have. You, you're always going to have a scarcity of time, even if you have no scarcity of any other sort. So we'll discuss that in the Utopia episode. But so immigration is allowing people to move freely without, you know, as if there are no borders. And so that would allow people to come to this planet. It wouldn't mean that they have the right to take the resource away like they wanted to do, like the Federation wanted to do, but it would make the planet really crowded they might not be able to keep the kind of little utopia that they have there and maybe that's what the civil war in a sense was about sounds like it was when they kicked the sona off they said you don't want to live like we do you want to use technology so they did benefit in the sense that they got to have their utopia as they wanted it and live forever on the planet in their utopia as opposed to living together on the planet in a different kind of society that they didn't want What do you think of that? Yeah, I've always wished they went a little deeper into the amount of resources they have, water, food, soil, because they don't really give you an understanding of could the Baku just have stopped on the other side of the planet and they'd never see each other again. If that was the case, then you know what? Sorry, Baku. You, you, I mean, sorry, Sona. You left and you could have just stayed on the other side of the planet. I don't understand why you didn't just do that. Maybe the rings only affect people on the planet in a certain hemisphere, in a certain area. And in, it seems like there would be a lot of room, but we could maybe assume that there's not that much room in the place where you get to have all of the benefits from the rings. Yeah, because they don't really show the land masses either. It could be one small island and a lot of water. We don't really, we have no judge of that. So we can only have what, to, we can only go off of what they showed us. Which is, like you said, the one main key is is the lack of scarcity of time. And without that, they've been able to figure out everything else. And there's an interesting line that Picard uses when he says, I, I wish I had centuries to learn. And Anish says to him, well, it took us centuries to learn. It doesn't take centuries to learn. But now they've had centuries to learn all the things they need to provide enough food, water, materials, clothing, and everything else. And you want to pick them up and dump them somewhere else and tell them, well, now you only have this much time Teach your kids, hurry up, let's get moving. Yeah, the lack of scarcity of time is what makes it a true utopia, I think, and what makes it a an interesting case for really looking at the question whether it's right to protect them because they're peaceful in their utopia and the protection of the utopia itself is perhaps a good. And it seems that some of them come to decide like Picard when you know he and uh, Anja or whatever spend their their time together he wants to protect her he wants to protect what she has kind of like the way well there's another Voyager episode where there's a primitive culture underneath the force field that's protecting it and they want to protect it the aliens came and created this energy barrier to protect them And the good was the protection of that society. The society itself was the good. It wasn't simply about doing violence or not doing violence to them. It was that the society itself was something that they wanted to protect. And I think you can have a a disagreement about that. And I have some analysis of, of that movie, if we want to get into that, about, you know, whether it makes sense to protect them or maybe you're holding them back and and they could actually grow anyway in this case it clearly is a utopia they really they love it and so you might want to protect it for that sake but i think the strongest argument that they make is more this non-aggression principle thing which is as picard says at one point that you know he is tempted to go along with the federation and benefit from it But he says, some of the darkest chapters in the history of my world involve the forced relocation of a group of people to satisfy the demands of a larger one. So the 
needs of the many and the needs of the few, the consequentialist arguments are no good because the darkest chapters in history come out of that kind of a, a justification. It's the same way that we were talking about earlier with Mao and, you know, the the idea that if you allow yourself to use a means that involves violence, then even though your ends may be good, you'll end up corrupting it. And that's something Star Trek talks about a lot, about the means and the ends. And so Picard says, you know, the means would be violence and he's not willing to do that even though he is tempted by the outcome right it would also be the, the death of a society as we know it because even if the baku survive and the race continues on for another 200 years it would not be the same as when it had unlimited time it would have to change the, the culture itself would have right to and change. that's the prime directive and we've seen this over and over again in our own history just look at world war ii you had the forced relocation and murder of of Jews in Nazi Germany. You you had Hitler marching into other countries basically to do the same. In America, you had Japanese people put in, into camps, internment camps. And they they told them it was for their protection. They told us it was for our protection. And they told anyone who would listen whatever answer they wanted to justify taking a group of people and putting them into an area without their permission to do so. The Japanese in, in America were not walking to these places asking for a place to live behind fences. That's what we did, uh, you know, as a country. Government itself did this, and they gave you all kinds of reasons, but it wasn't right. Just like moving these people, I don't believe, is right. I, I, I know that they had a fight, they banned them from the planet, but it's not our decision to make between those two. By the same token, it's not our decision to fight their war for them against the Sona, but the Sona have the backing of the Federation. So for Picard to get involved, I don't see that as a problem at that point. Right. But so do you believe then that the Baku should be protected against the Sona or do the Sona have the right to try to get some of, of what they believe they deserve from the Baku. In this scenario, I think they should be protected. The Baku should be protected. But only because, in this scenario, but it's only because you have an admiral throwing the whole weight of the Federation behind the Sona to do it. The Federation basically funded this. You can only imagine that the, the Federation must have paid for the assembly of the injector, or must have done something because don't, they don't really have money, but they have things to barter and trade, obviously. They, they have something, because they didn't just offer them to give them this great and wonderful anti-aging chemicals for nothing. So the Federation must have basically funded the Sona to do this to the Baku. Okay, but let's say that the Baku don't want the Sona there at all, and the Sona, in addition, would probably die if they just moved there, and they're both originally... They were both on the planet and had the chance to have that wealth. Let's call it let's call it wealth, that immortality. So if the Sona were originally there and could have had that immortality, but the Baku kicked them off, and now the Baku are saying you're not allowed back and you can't have this wealth, then should the Federation actually protect the, the Baku in that way. And I'll give you an example of why you might think that that's not fair. There's this little story called Libertarianism Starting Now. And so it goes like this. Basically, guy number one steals an iPad from guy number two. Okay? So, uh, or it's Adam and George. So Adam says, basically, my ancestors stole someone else's land. Everybody's fine. And I can keep this iPad. And George says, no, you just stole my iPad just now. Give it back. And Adam says, look, you're making the whole thing very complicated. How do you know? My ancestors stole something from your ancestors. Your ancestors stole something from mine. How far back into history are you going to go? Do you really want to go back to the beginning of time and sort out all the injustices of history? That's impossible. And George says, I just want my iPad back. You just stole it. <laughs> and again, Adam continues and, and says, you want to correct these injustices, but that's arbitrary. You could go all the way back in history correcting injustices. Why would you arbitrarily want to sort this one out? Let's just be better about in the future enforcing property rights. So the question is, when do you, when do you start? What injustices are okay to correct and what injustices are not? And if you can't use that difficulty to 
justify stealing something from me right now. But what if I stole something from you just 10 minutes before? So there's a, there's always a time limit on these things in, in terms of being able to enforce and being able to decide. And sometimes it's just common sense. You just say, well, you can't justify stealing something from me now. That makes no sense. But so can you justify the fact that Baku stole from the Sona just whatever, 50, 100 years ago, however long it was, when they're living forever. And essentially, they did it just now, and the Sona are suffering right now. So do you want to start protecting the Baku and protecting people's property rights right when the Baku have this incredible wealth that they essentially stole from the Sona? Does that make sense? No, it makes perfect sense. No, it makes it makes perfect sense. The problem is... I don't think we have enough backstory on when these things happened, who started the fight, and all that would change a lot of the scenarios. Would it? So that's why I can say under this scenario, with the Federation spending money to remove the so- the Baku from the planet and help the Sona, then I believe yes, Picard is correct in defending. Most people would probably agree Picard is correct in defending them no matter what, especially since they show them as conscientious objectors who will not defend themselves, that always gets you sympathy. I mean, if they were willing to pick up a gun, then it's a lot easier for the Federation to turn around and walk away completely and say, you two have at it and whoever wins, wins. Yeah, I think it's really important that the Baku are nonviolent in this scenario. But I don't know that we need to know all of the details. If we can assume, let's say, that the Baku were wrong to the Sona, that they kept the great wealth and they kicked the Sona off violently and then ask the question whether we can truly say that it's right to simply protect the Baku after they did this. We're protecting their ill-gotten gains, aren't we? Not necessarily, because the Sona broke the rules of the society when they chose to go and use technology. Did they? I don't think we know that. I think that was a disagreement between those who became the Baku and those who became the Sona. They were two halves of the society, and they disagreed on whether or not they should use technology, and they had a fight about it, and the Baku won, and decided to kick out the Sona and keep their beautiful utopia without technology. I'm sure someone in Babel Conference will tell which one of us is right (laughs) in that one. But I'm pretty sure they established that it was against the root laws of the society to use technology. That the reason why they went through the briar patch in the first place to get to a planet where almost no one could get to was because they wanted to get away from from technology because technology always ended in war. Okay. Okay. No, you, you may be right about that detail. But does that change everything? And what if that detail was different? What if they hadn't already had that law? Would that change everything? It could. See, the problem is no one principle is going to work for every single scenario because a minor detail changes the entire scenario. That is very well said. That is almost exactly what we were talking about before when I mentioned the myth of the rule of law, that you can't simply have one law that works for everything, be it the prime directive or, you know, in this case, the non-aggression principle or the principle of nonviolence. Even nonviolence, you'll have to sometimes break that if you need to fight someone who is even more terrible in some way or another. Correct. For instance, okay, so we go back now. The Sona, the Baku are on the planet. The Sona want the planet. They're wrong because they're removing a peaceful people. But then we go back a little farther, we find out, okay, that's not necessarily the truth because they threw the Sona off the planet. The Sona are actually the Baku. They are just no longer benefiting from the rings and they call themselves the Sona. And then we find out, well, they broke the laws in the first place by using technology that was only used to get here and then they wanted to get rid of. But if we go back a little farther, do we find out that the people who wanted the technology were the ones who didn't want to go in the first place, but as children were brought there against their will because they have to listen to their parents? Right. And so it it keeps changing. Exactly. And but that also, you know, reminds us. So how far back do you want to go back correcting injustices? You know, and you have that same question then about stealing the iPad and saying, but you want to correct this injustice. But what about the injustice that happened 10 minutes earlier or a year earlier or a hundred years earlier. And so how much do you care about each of these, about correcting the injustice or do you want to, to simply from now on, let's protect the rights of the Baku and of everyone else going forward, even if the Baku have this ill gotten gains. And I think it was ingenious of Star Trek to make sure that the 
people involved were all within the same generation. That all of this happened within the one generation. That the people that were kicked off the planet were the were the ones coming back. It wasn't their children or their grandchildren or their great grandchildren. Because the people on the planet were always going to stay the same. They were going to live forever. But the people coming back were the ones who were actually thrown off. So they were the ones who, if you believe they were wrongfully thrown off the planet, they were physically the ones wrongfully thrown off the planet. And that makes it just that much more complicated. Because it's a lot easier to detach yourself from the scenario and say, well, you know what? It happened four generations ago. You guys know how to live out there. You're on your own. But to say, well, you got the, you literally lived in that house down the block and now can't go back changes many people's perception of right and wrong. And again, the Star Trek writers showed us that the truth was that they believed you just can't have your planet back. It is what it is and it's over. I think we can all agree you can't move them in the middle of the night without their knowledge on a hollow deck. I think that's pretty easy to agree that they should at least have some knowledge it's coming. Even if they disagree and get forcefully removed, it's wrong, but they didn't even have a chance to defend themselves if Data hadn't snapped and started showing, you know, all the installations that were around the area. Yeah, the Federation were certainly acting like thugs. And there was a, a funny line in there where Doherty says, we're partnering with the Sona. And Picard says, your partners are nothing more than petty thugs. And Doherty says, well, on Earth, Petroleum once turned petty thugs into world leaders and warp drive and we can handle the Sona, he says. But that's exactly it is they've become petty thugs and with resources petty thugs are the thugs of the whole world or the whole galaxy world leaders and so forth who are acting like thugs and i think that's one of the dangers along with the other dangers that we mention if you do try to do this kind of reallocation of resources based on past injustices and you have many resources that you're therefore willing to reallocate from one person to another, redistribute, then that can give people power and it can turn a kind democratic government into a government struggling over these resources and willing to use violence and wielding these resources as tyrants. Um, little petty thugs become big tyrants, and that's you know the the worst the worst rise to the top is is one way of uh, that's a one theory by Hayek. Again, we'll we'll talk about that in a future episode in the Utopian episode, but that kind of thing where power corrupts and so on, and resources can turn people into um, powerful, but a powerful thugs essentially. They're still they're still the people who would steal it from you, who would steal your iPad. But now they have power and now the resources that they can grab are much bigger and that drives them even more and gives them even more power over others. So I think that's that's another concern that comes out of this and kind of brings us back to this idea that maybe you just need to protect the Baku, even though they maybe have resources that they should have shared. And But I would still hope that they can come to a compromise, but that would be maybe more of a voluntary compromise made internally between the Baku and the Sona, certainly not involving the Federation. I guess if they wanted to come to a compromise, it would have had to happen 10 or 15 years earlier in order for it to make any real difference for the Sona, which is another one of those little bits of information they shove in there just to make it harder to figure out who's really right and wrong. But... We've, we've been going around and around this, you know, for an hour now, talking about who was right, who was wrong, how far back we go. Do you have any final thoughts on this episode? I guess I, I just think it's really interesting. And I think um, looking at it from the perspective of the non-aggression principle was really interesting. And um, and teasing through it, I do, I do think it's a very difficult conundrum. You know, it is kind of a moral conundrum, which is probably not something that will be really discussing in future podcasts that much, the the kind of moral conundrum thing. I think that Metatrex does that really well. Um, but we'll probably focus on other kinds of questions in the future. But this one, I think, benefited from coming to it with, say, the non-aggression principle and other kind of more political science approaches instead of the purely moral value ethics kind of approaches that you might get on Metatrex. So I think it was very much worthwhile looking at it. Uh, Definitely a a difficult question. 
How about you? Do you have any final thoughts? Well, it's interesting. In I'm one of the few people who actually really like the movie, for <laughs> one. Uh, many people don't enjoy the movie. I actually did, and mostly because of the issues we've gone over here today. I like the fact that they throw it at you in a hard way. They don't give you an easy out anywhere. You can't side with either side easily. There's arguments for both sides. There's economic and sociological excuses for why one side is right or the other side is right or no one's right. You know, on top of that, when we really get into it, you could apply game theory to this. You could apply uh, other forms of, of sociological measures that would decide a society's worth or value. We didn't really get into those. We focused really more on just the right and wrong of it from an economic standpoint, from a, a sociological standpoint, but not the individual principles you could plug in there outside of the non-aggression pact and Marxism. But, but I think those are two good ones to do on this because they are so opposing to each other. One says you leave them alone and they're allowed to be the way they are and it's okay for the Federation to step in because someone's using violence against them. And the other one says, nope, you take it away from them and you share it amongst everybody. And now it's up to you to decide which one of those two you agree with. I think before hearing this, almost everyone would just agree it was wrong to try and remove the sonar. I'm hoping that this gives them a little more to think about. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's kind of in keeping with our podcast, our episodes going forward, because I think we will be coming back to the opposition of Marxism with libertarian and Austrian economics. Uh, I'll explain what that is in a future episode. But these kind of opposing this more free market approach versus the Marxist approach, we'll be coming back to that in future episodes in ways that you might find more obvious. (laughs) Because I, I don't think anyone would have maybe watched this movie and said, non-aggression principle, definitely, versus Marxism, definitely. But I think it was exactly a perfect way of looking at it. Well, it's been fun talking about the non-aggression principle and insurrection with you here today, but it's not the only thing we've been discussing on the network. So here's a quick look at some of the other things you may have missed elsewhere on Trek FM. Previously on Trek.FM, Stage 9, a podcast about the people who make Star Trek. By getting people like Braga to come on board and work on this show, what they're going to be doing is deconstructing that that thing that they did for all those years on Star Trek. Earl Grey. Is there anything else we need to add, or do we think that's the? Are we going to are we going to cure Riker or? <laughs> oh shoot, I forgot about Riker. Yeah, sure, fine, we'll keep him around. Yeah, we've cured Riker, and then uh, for for me, this would yeah or, or not. <laughs> Meta Trex. Troy's quarters. Data's quarters. They're very Spartan. They're very Spartan. In fact, Data's girlfriend even says they're Spartan. Yes, yes. And so what does she do? She brings him stuff. A trinket to fill it up. To, to <laughs> fill it up. Warp 5. And this reminds me so much of the cage. So much of the cage. See, I think of... Uh, yeah, you think of the cage too, but I also think of... Uh, of uh, What's his name? B- Baylock in the Corbomite maneuver. Yes, right? yes. Offering him the drink. Trying, yeah. <laughs> and that's what else is happening on Trek.fm. Check out all these shows and join the conversation about your favorite corner of the Star Trek universe and beyond. You'll find us wherever you get your podcasts. If you're an Apple user, be sure to hit the subscribe button in Apple Podcasts on iPhone, iPad, or Apple TV or the desktop iTunes app to get the latest episodes as soon as they're published. And please leave us a star rating and written review. If you're not an Apple user, we've got you covered as well. You can find our shows on Google Play Music, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spreaker, SoundCloud, Windows Phone, in most third-party apps, and you can stream and download the MP3 file directly from the website or grab the RSS link. We'd love to get your thoughts on today's show, and there are many ways for you to do that. The best place to join in the larger conversation is the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the search field on Facebook, and it should come right up. If you'd like to send us an email, you can use the form on our website at trekfm slash contact. Choose message to a Trek FM show and select the Briar Patch. That's trek.fm slash contact. That will come right to us. You can also find the network on Twitter at Trek FM, 
and on Facebook at facebook.com slash trekfm. So Patrick, when you're not discussing small planets full of immortality and great health, where can our listeners find you on the interwebs and around the Trek FM network? They can find me on the Babel Conference. I check it every day. I don't always answer. I don't always respond to posts, but I, I read them all. I see most of the responses. They can also find me on Twitter at Magic Drop 5. That's one word. The five is a number. And anywhere on Facebook, really, you can friend me. I'll be sure to, to grab that and click yes, and, and we can have conversations there. And Guinevere, when you're not pushing a non-aggression pack down people's throats, where can <laughs> people find you? Yeah, well, um, you might find me pushing the non-aggression pact or pushing some of my other ideas um, as well on Facebook. Uh, I do post a lot on Facebook. It's a place where I hang out, including at the Babel Conference. Um, but you can also just search for me. So my name is Guinevere Nell. That's G-U-I-N-E-V-E-R-E. Nell, N-E-L-L. And so you can find me on Facebook like that. And also Guinevere42 on Twitter, although I don't use it as much as Facebook so far. Well, if you'd like to help us keep all of our shows coming to you each week, you can become a patron of the network on Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash trekfm. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trekfm to get all the details. Perks include early access to episodes, exclusive content, producer credits, and more available through our special patrons website, Patron Zone. It requires a great deal of money to produce, host, and distribute these shows each month. We really appreciate any support you can give us and hope you'll join the team. Again, you'll find all the details at patreon.com slash trekfm. We'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the rest of the Briar Patch team from the network, specifically C. Brian Jones, founder and publisher of Trek FM, executive producers Matthew Rushing and Ken Tripp, Aaron Harvey, our art director, Richard Marquez, production manager, and Patreon manager Brandon Shea Mutala. Also, don't forget to check out Enterprise in Space, a project of the nonprofit National Space Society. Visit enterpriseinspace.org to find out more and get your seat on the mission. And check out audible.com, offering more than 180,000 titles for your desktop or mobile device. To get a free audiobook of your choice, visit audibletrial.com slash trekfm. Well, we must be heading back into the Briar Patch now. It takes about a day to get to a place where we can transmit from. So till next time, this is Guinevere and Patrick signing out. Mm-hmm.